Good evening. On behalf of the Donald Brand School of Information and Computer Sciences, I want to welcome you all to the first of uh, two lectures in this year's ICS Distinguished Lecturer Series. Our distinguished lecturer this evening is uh, Stuart Russell, Professor of Computer Science and holder of the Smith Zadek Chair in Engineering at the University of California at Berkeley, where he also serves as the director of the Center for Human Compatible AI and the Kavli Center for Ethics, Science, and the Public. Professor Russell is a recipient of the Computers and Thought Award from the International Joint Conference on AI, the Research Excellence Award from the International Joint, Joint Conference on AI, and the Alan Newell Award from the Association for Computing Machinery. Uh, from 2012 to 2014, he held the Sir Blaise Pascal in Paris. In 2021, he received the OBE from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and gave the BBC Reith Lectures. Professor Russell is an honorary fellow of Wadham College, Oxford, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, an AI 2050 Senior Fellow, and a Fellow of the uh, Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, uh, ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, his book, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach with Peter Norvig, is the standard text in AI. It's used in over 1,500 universities in 135 countries. His research covers a wide range of topics in artificial intelligence with a current emphasis on the long-term future of AI and its relation to humanity. He has developed a new global seismic monitoring system for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and is currently working to ban lethal autonomous weapons. Professor Asser currently serves as co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Council on AI, co-chair of the OECD Expert Group on AI Futures, and US representative at the Global Partnership for AI. The title of his lecture this evening is How Not to Destroy the World with AI on Second Thoughts. Please join me in welcoming Professor Russell to the podium. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, and I'm delighted to be back in Irvine after a gap of quite a few years. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about AI and what I think is going on, maybe what uh, is likely to happen going forward. But before we get into that, um, I want to explain what AI is in a very simple form. So. Obviously, AI is about making intelligent machines, and the question has always been, what does that mean, right? How could you tell if a machine is intelligent? How do we go about designing machines that are intelligent? And the definition that the field settled on pretty quickly um, back in the 1950s and early 60s uh, is what I've called here the standard model, and it's actually uh, a standard model not just for AI, but also for um, control theory, for operations research, for statistics, for economics, and several other disciplines. And it's this simple idea that a machine is intelligent to the extent that its actions can be expected to achieve its objectives. So this is borrowed pretty directly from, uh, from philosophy and economics, the idea of rational behavior. And the nice thing about this definition, as opposed to definitions, for example, based on imitating human beings, uh, is that you can start from this and work back to figure out how to make a machine that has this property. And we've done a lot of that over the last few decades. But AI is different from control theory, for example, or operations research, uh, in that we really want the whole thing. We want general purpose AI systems that can quickly learn high quality behavior in any task environment. And high quality here means roughly that it should be able to match or exceed human capabilities. So this type of general purpose AI uh, has been the goal of the field since the beginning. 
And so now I have a slide saying, have we succeeded? Right? Ten years ago, nobody would have this slide in their talk because it wasn't even a question, right? But now it appears to be a question. Uh, in fact, uh, my co-author on the textbook, Peter Norvig, just published a paper saying, basically, yes, we have succeeded. Uh, you know, not that our AI systems are ruling the world already, but what he means is, in the same sense that the Wright brothers produced an airplane that flew under its own power, you know, and now we have 777s and Concords and things, right? But that's basically just bigger and faster. But the basic problem was solved by the Wright brothers. And Peter's view is that we have solved the basic problem, that the technology we have, specifically the large language models, is the solution for general purpose AI. So I, <laughs> I, I don't agree. Um, and I could give an entire talk, and my, my friend Gary Marcus does give entire talks uh, explaining all of the reasons why large language models are, are not close to the sort of general intelligence that we want. Um, but I think, you know, I'd like to be generous and say they have done something, right? They, they are exhibiting certain types of generality uh, and robustness that we did not see from other kinds of AI systems most of which were extremely specialized uh, to particular tasks. And so I think it's probably accurate to say that whatever it is that these GPT-like models are doing, uh, if and when we figure out what that is, uh, then that'll be a piece of the puzzle that we're trying to put together of general purpose AI, just as we have already discovered many other pieces of the puzzle during the history of AI. But the problem we face right now is we have no idea what this puzzle piece is, right? So in some sense, we've made a practical advance, but not a scientific advance, because we haven't understood what it is that we've done. And so we can't build on it. We don't know what to do when it doesn't work, uh, and so on. So uh, you know, in talking to journalists, I often liken this to, to what happened maybe five, 10,000 years ago when someone accidentally left a large amount of fruit in a, in a, in a vase to rot uh, and then accidentally drank it and got completely drunk, right? And then, wow, this is great, right? We got something that's really cool, but we don't know how it works and we don't, don't really even know how to replicate it properly. And occasionally we drink it and kill ourselves. So this is sort of the situation we're in right now with large language models. Um, so let me go back a bit and just talk about, you know, AI. So we said it's, you know, systems that uh, take actions that can be expected to achieve their objectives. So an AI system is just a mapping from uh, a history of sensory input, so, you know, everything the system has experienced, to decisions about what actions to take uh, on the output side, so from sensory inputs to behavior. Uh, and the question is, what goes in this box? And uh, this is the current answer, right? Just massive amounts of circuit. So how big is the circuit? Uh, so on the scale that you see here, which is sort of like chain link fence scale, right? Uh, the, the circuit for GPT-4, which is estimated to have a trillion parameters, would roughly cover the entire greater Los Angeles area. Right, so all the way from Malibu down to Orange County and all the way out to Lake Arrowhead or somewhere, right? So it's about that big, okay? So it just gives you, just to give you a kind of a gut feel, right? And then you ask, well, you know, where's the part that, uh, you know, that can write songs in the style of, um, you know, Jimi Hendrix or, you know, guitar solo, right? It can do it, but it's, it's impossible to find the part of the network that can do that and to understand how it does that and so on. So we're making tiny little inroads uh, into understanding, but to a first approximation, we don't understand the internal principles of operation at all. So you, you start with this giant circuit, um, and each of those connections is tunable, right? We can adjust the connection strengths so that the overall input-output mapping that this circuit implements is 
is adjusted by changing all the connection strengths in the circuit. And you make it better by stochastic gradient descent. You, you compute which direction should I tune each of those connection strengths so that the quality of behavior improves. So it's a very simple idea. I can teach uh, you know, undergrads most of what they need to know uh, in a couple of hours, starting from scratch uh, to, to build these kinds of systems and, and write the code. Um, let me go back a little bit in time to the 1950s. Right, so one hypothesis in the 1950s was we fill that box with Fortran programs. And here are some Fortran programs, right? And, um, and we learn those Fortran programs not just by stochastic gradient descent, by making small random perturbations to the code, but also by crossover, so taking pairs of Fortran programs and mixing them together to get new Fortran programs. And they were able to show um, progress. They were able to have these systems learn to exhibit certain simple behaviors and learn certain simple functions. Um, but you should remember that they were using 10 million, million, million times less computation than we are today. So had they been using 10 million, million, million more time, times more computation, who knows what they would have been able to achieve uh, with this approach. But the approach that dominated most of the history of AI uh, is the knowledge-based approach, the idea that AI systems... Uh, you know, at the core, know things. And I think, that, you know, intuitively and introspectively, uh, this is how we think about ourselves, that there's just a ton of stuff that we know, and we're able to put that knowledge together in chains of reasoning and planning so that we can function successfully in the world. And a lot of that uh, was then reproduced within AI. We developed uh, reasoning algorithms, we developed perception, and learning algorithms to fill the knowledge base, uh, and then reasoning algorithms to operate on the knowledge to answer questions, uh, planning algorithms to construct uh, complicated behaviors. And the, the substrate for knowledge in the early days, in the 1960s, uh, was logic. Right? And there were some straightforward, simple reasons that you know, first-order logic was the only formal language we had at that time that had anything like the expressive power that you would need, you know, whether it was to do mathematics or reason about a chessboard or reasoning about doing the shopping, you know, you, you manage in the world because you understand the world as containing objects, right? Chairs, people, microphones, laptops, right? And first order logic is the only mathematical language available at that time uh, in which objects existed as first class entities that you could reason about. So basically, first order logic is the mathematics of objects and how they relate to each other. Uh, so in, if you think about the fact that the world does have things in it, uh, you're going to need something like first order logic to manage. So in the 80s and 90s, um, it, it began to be clear that we couldn't just use logic. We had to handle uncertainty. And so we brought in probability theory. Uh, Uta Pearl at UCLA and others uh, really developed uh, the technology that allowed us to do probabilistic reasoning at scale, to build large models, to learn those models from data, and so on. And then the 2000s, uh, these two came together uh, in the sense that now we have uh, languages with the full expressive power of first order logic, so they actually can reason about entities, uh, and the existence of objects, the identity of objects, and so on, uh, and incorporate probability theory so that the whole process of inference from noisy information works correctly. So this had many successes, but I would say, at the moment, uh, the, this approach is clearly dominant. Uh, so I would say, you know, roughly, 20 times as many papers being published in this paradigm compared to this one. But I actually think knowledge-based uh, AI is, is really important. The thing that we didn't do is justify the hypothesis. Why is it a good idea to build systems based on 
internal representations of knowledge, right? Um, and I think the answer actually is that there, there are several modes of learning that you can only really exhibit with knowledge-based systems. So this is a common picture of what machine learning is, that data comes in, learning happens, and then knowledge comes out the other end, right? But this is an incredibly impoverished picture, if you think about it, right? This is sort of, it doesn't even apply to a human being at the moment of birth, because in fact, we're born with a fair amount of uh, actual knowledge of the real world, oddly enough. Um, so most learning that happens in humans happens in the presence of not just data, but also knowledge. And of course, where did that come from? Well, it comes from the output of learning. So the knowledge-based approach supports this kind of cumulative um, learning, which is, which is uh, I think, the hallmark of what you need uh, to, to be really generally intelligent. And we just started in, uh, to prove real mathematical results saying why, right? Why is this better, right? Instead of just hand-waving, um, actually show that um, the sample complexity of learning uh, is uh, much better, right? And um, I could, I'm happy to answer questions later on, on why it is, but if you have agents that learn an internal model of their environment and then use that to make decisions, as opposed to learning a direct input-output mapping to make decisions, uh, you can show for a fairly large class of environments that the sample complexity is exponentially better uh, when you do things this way. And if you want to uh, confound a deep learning advocate, you could have them, uh, you could give them an example like this, right? So this is an example of, of human intelligence at work. Here's some black holes uh, on the other side of the universe and the black holes are rotating around each other, and uh, in the process, they're emitting gravitational waves. And uh, as they get closer and closer, the, the energy emitted in the waves gets larger and larger. And in fact, at the, at the peak energy emission, these two black holes are emitting more energy than all the stars in the universe. In fact, 50 times as much energy as all the stars in the universe. And then, you know, a, a few billion years later, those gravitational waves arrive on Earth. And we just happen to have built this amazing thing, the Large Interferometric Gravitational Observatory. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, I think, each arm is 2.2 kilometers long and filled with physics, right? Lasers, computers, mirrors, other, all sorts of stuff. And this can measure the distortion of space by gravitational waves to 18 decimal places. And just to give you a sense, if we moved Alpha Centauri further away from the Earth by the width of a human hair, this system would be able to detect the difference. Right? So it's absolutely mind-boggling. And not only were they able to detect the gravitational waves, they were able to predict based on the accumulation of centuries of physics, uh, the actual form of those gravitational waves. And from the form, they were able to infer the masses of the black holes that were colliding on the other side of the universe. This is absolutely amazing. And they got Nobel Prize for this, right? And then you go to a deep learning advocate and say, hey, can your deep learning system do this? You know, and if not, then, uh, you know, come back when you can, right? And their sort of mouth drops open and steam comes out of their ears and so on, right? Uh, because, you know, there weren't any examples of gravitational wave detectors before this one was built, right? So there was zero training data. And the, the way they did it was to build on, as I said, centuries of accumulation of knowledge of physics. Uh, and then also, you know, the design and construction process was a, a plan involving maybe tens of millions or hundreds of millions of steps uh, to actually get this uh, to function, right? And we're just so far away from being able to do that, right? Large language models, not, just not even in the game at all. So 
so I don't agree with Peter that we have basically solved the problem. And here's the thing, right? We, we, we've hit a, upon a technology, these deep learning circuits, which are better, I would say, than the previous machine learning technologies, which were roughly you know, linear regression and, and in various family members are there, or decision trees. And um, deep learning circuits are wide. They, they can operate on many inputs, but they can also do many operations on those inputs. So they have properties that uh, linear regression and decision trees have, but, um, but they combine those properties. And so by and large, they're a better learning technology, not in every case, but mostly they're just a more powerful learning technology. And they have this property which companies love that if you pump more money in, right, in the form of bigger models and more data, you get better performance uh, out the end. But they have some really, I think, maybe unavoidable problems. That if you, if you think about feed-forward networks in particular, right, they can only compute for linear time, meaning the amount of computation that gets done between the input arriving and the output coming out is just proportional to the size of the circuit. Okay, and they can't do any more than that. And so what that means is that if, they're, if you're asking them to learn a function that isn't a linear time function, for example, an NP-hard decision problem, meaning that we don't expect it to, have, uh, to be solvable in less than exponential time, right? That means that in order to learn that function, it's going to have to be an exponentially large circuit, right? Which means you're going to have an exponential amount of training data to, to learn that function, even though the function itself may be very simply describable. And so it's unable to trade computation time for sample complexity. And so uh, I think this is a fundamental uh, obstacle to having these systems really solve general intelligence. And I'll give you one example, right? And, and often uh, at this point in the argument, the deep learning advocate will say, well, you know, what about Go, right? We showed, we showed those humans, right? We, you know, we, deep learning was enough to defeat the human world champion at Go. Um, and so, uh, so we thought about that for a bit. And uh, so if you don't play Go, it's, it's a very simple game, right? One side is black, the other side is white. You put stones on the board, and um, you try to surround territory with your stones. Uh, you also try to surround your opponent's stones, and if you surround them completely, then those stones are captured. And that's basically it, right? Um, and uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Go programs beat the human world champion uh, around 2017. And so the, in the rating scheme uh, in Go, the human world champion is around 3,800. And the best programs are now at 5,200. And in fact, JBX Cata 005, uh, when we started this project, was the leading Go program in the world. And so 5,200 is massively superhuman, right? Typically, if, if JBX Cata 005 played the world champion, would probably win 1,000 games out of 1,000, right? So it's, you know, humans are no longer in the game at all. So here's a game between Kellen Pellerin, who's a grad student um, at Montreal, but works with our research group. And Kellen is going to play white, and he's going to play against JBX Cata 005. Zero 05, this massively superhuman Go program. And he's going to give Kata 005 a nine stone handicap. So, so Black gets to start with nine stones on the board already, right? So this is the kind of handicap you give when you're teaching a five-year-old to play the game, right? So that they can at least stay in the game for, for some time, okay? And so it's a complete insult. To, to a superhuman Go program, that it's being given nine stones to start. Okay, so let's just, I'll just go, th we'll play through the game fairly quickly and keep an eye on what happens in the bottom right uh, quadrant. 
And remember, the human is playing white. And so Kellen starts to make a little group of stones. And then quickly, black surrounds that group to prevent it from growing and spreading across the board. And then white starts to surround the black stones. Right? So you're making a kind of a circular sandwich here. And um, black has many, many opportunities to escape, but just ignores those opportunities and pays no attention, doesn't seem to understand that its pieces are about to be captured. Poof. Right? And so it loses the game. So this is a superhuman Go program losing in a way that you know, a novice human being would easily notice and easily be able to avoid. Why? What's going on? Well, as usual, we haven't the faintest idea. Right? Uh, we think that, um, that because of the lack of expressive power of circuits, circuits are a terrible language for trying to write down the rules of Go, right? to recognize what is a group of stones, when is a group of stones captured or not captured, right? Because these are easy to write as you know, three-line Python programs, but they're extraordinarily difficult to write as circuits. And we think that it simply failed to learn those concepts correctly, and we found a class of groups of stones that they just don't recognize as groups of stones, or they're not able to calculate how many empty spaces the stones have, in other words, how long they can survive. Um, because as it goes around the circuit, it forgets how many it's counting, right, or something. We don't really know what's going on, but they're not learning the basic concepts of Go correctly. So, you know, in 2017, when, when AlphaGo beat uh, Ke Jie, who was the Chinese world champion, that was China's Sputnik moment. That, that was when the Chinese government decided that AI was the biggest geopolitical a uh, strategic objective for the Chinese state and committed over $150 billion of money to fund their development of AI in China. And now it looks like that was a complete mistake, right? That actually something different happened. Uh, we thought that this was the eclipse of human Go players, but actually we just misunderstood. We probably gave them too much respect because you would never play this against a real human player because it's not a very successful strategy and they would cotton on immediately what you were trying to do uh, and, and they would avoid it. So, um, so I think we've been overestimating the capabilities of uh, the current generation of AI systems. But on the other hand, it's undeniable that there has been a lot of progress in perception, visual perception, and speech recognition, uh, in language understanding. Uh, in lots of these areas, we can't deny that uh, capabilities and, and generality are much, much greater than they were. And as I mentioned, we are investing uh, at enormous rates, probably investing more in creating uh, artificial general intelligence than we are in the rest of science put together. So, you could say, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure all that money is just going to go to waste, right? Uh, and all those brilliant people, I mean, lots of really, really, really brilliant people are working in this area now. Um, so I think it's reasonable to suppose that eventually, possibly not on the present path by just scaling up large language models, but I think eventually, and most people think uh, in the relatively near future, like, 10 to 20 years, we will succeed in creating general purpose AI. So I'll, the rest of the talk I'll, uh, is basically trying to answer this question, right? What if we succeed? And if we did succeed, right, we could do some really cool things, such as lift the living standards of everyone on Earth to a respectable level, right? How could we do that? Well, by definition, if you have general purpose AI, it can do anything that human beings can do. And this is one of the things we've been able to do, is deliver a respectable standard of living to maybe 10% of the population of the Earth, or 20%, depending on how you measure. So, um, so we could do that, but we could do it much more cheaply, because you're taking all those expensive humans out of the supply chain. And you could do it at a much greater scale. Um, 
So if we did that, it would be about a tenfold in increase in the effective GDP of the world, and the net present value would be about $13.5 quadrillion. So that's a lower bound on the value of general purpose AI as a technology. And then when you look at that number, the 150 billion that China is investing, uh, and that uh, in some the, the Western companies are investing, uh, is actually negligible. Um, and we could probably do more things too, right? I mean, that's good, you know, 13.5 quadrillion, quadrillion is already plenty, but we could actually have a better civilization than we have now. Um, we could have much better, more individualized healthcare, much better uh, individual tutoring of children so that they really can fulfill their potential. Probably we're already seeing faster uh, rate of scientific progress um, because of the use of AI tools, both in you know, everything from high energy physics uh, to, to medicine, drug design, and so on. Okay, so this is Alan Turing, and, and he was asked, uh, he gave a lecture in 1951, and, and the question was, you know, what if we succeed? And, and he said, it seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So that's, uh, that's Alan Turing's view of the, of the question. And um, he doesn't, I mean, you can read the typescript of his, of his lecture. He doesn't offer any mitigation or solution to this problem, just, it's just basically resignation. But basically, we paid very little attention. In fact, most people in AI didn't even know that Turing said this until quite recently. Because it's, it's not a published speech. We just happened to have you know, a scan of the TypeScript in the Turing archive. So I, I tried to sort of wake people up um, by imagining the following email exchange, right, where a superior alien civilization uh, in Canis Major, writes to humanity at un.org and says, be warned, we shall arrive in 30 to 50 years' time. And humanity replies, uh, humanity is currently out of the office. We all respond to your message when we return. With a little smiley face on the end. <laughs> right, so this, this was how it was for, you know, from 1951 until actually well, uh, until pretty recently. So this is um, March 14th of last year, uh, OpenAI released GPT-4. Um, and a, a week later, Microsoft published their analysis of GPT-4. So they'd actually been working with it for several months and had studied its capabilities. And their title of their paper is Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence. So they kind of agree with Peter Norvig that this is it. Right? We basically have it, it's just a question of you know, fanning those sparks into flame and, uh, and then fixing a few minor, minor issues. And uh, so a week later, um, FLI, the Future of Life Institute, initiated this open letter saying, well, hold on a minute, you know, if that's true, we have no idea how to control such a system, so could you hold off a minute uh, until we figure out how to regulate this properly um, so that things don't go badly wrong. And I think it was that moment that caused humanity to return to the office. And then they saw this email from the aliens, basically, right? And, um, and what happened was actually fairly similar to what would happen if we really did get an email from the aliens, right? We had immediately, UNESCO sent out an urgent call to 193 heads of state saying implement, you know, all, remember all those, those AI principles, those vague uh, hand wavy principles you all signed up to, well, turn them into hard regulation now, right, before it's too late. Um, China uh, actually implemented really strict regulations, effectively a de facto ban on public facing large language models in China. Um, 
There were emergency meetings at the White House. Uh, Jeff Hinton, the, the sort of godfather of deep learning, resigned from Google specifically so that he could warn the world that this was for real. Uh, and Jeff's view is we probably don't have five years. So as he put it to me, uh, he's tidying up his affairs. Um, and then, you know, uh, in June, so, you know, the United, the UK government actually, you know, in February, they had been saying, well, there's nothing to see here, you know, no need to regulate, full speed ahead, pro-innovation. And then in June, Prime Minister announces that Britain is going to hold a global summit on AI safety. Uh, got 28 countries to, to attend, including China, to sign a statement saying, you know, this is for real, we need to do something about it, and so on. So really, I think in that period, the world woke up and, uh, and uh, asked, what on earth do we do about this? And it's up to the AI community, among others, to answer that question. So, so what should happen? I think um, one of the things that's clear is we can't afford to have uh, unsafe AI systems being developed anywhere, right? So it's no good China regulating and Europe regulating and then you know, American companies producing completely unsafe AI systems. So we need some type of international coordinating body you know, OpenAI is calling for an international atomic energy agency body, which, and what does that mean? That means a body that can go into OpenAI's office and demand to see what they're doing, right? So that's actually a quite powerful treaty, which is very unlikely to be agreed to by the United States. Um, but some type of coordinating body that ensures that all of the national regulatory agencies are making sure that the, the AI systems we build are safe. I think it would be a good idea at this point to have some specific regulations just to sort of wake up those regulatory muscles that have been atrophying for the last 50 years while the tech industry has done whatever it wanted to do with essentially no regulation. Um, and I think the simplest thing would be a law banning the impersonation of human beings by AI systems because I have not yet spoken to a single human being who thinks that's a good idea, right? And there's all kinds of reasons why it's a bad idea. But I think more generally, we have to uh, do what we do in many other areas, right? In, in medicine, in, uh, in aviation, in nuclear power, which is that we put the onus on the developers to provide hard evidence, I put proofs here, I'd be happy with a high confidence statement uh, to the regulator that their system uh, is safe according to certain definitions of what that means. Um, this is not the case right now, right? Uh, even in, uh, in the European Union uh, and even in China. We probably need uh, to make sure that uh, even open source systems automatically self-register so that regulators know which systems are operating where, and if any one of those systems starts to misbehave in dangerous ways, they can turn off all the copies. And so this means that open source systems have to have non-removable off switches and non-removable non uh, self-registration code. And the kinds of things that we mean by safety, right? I don't think we can, at the moment, define safety in a, in a completely general sense, although I'll talk about that. I think what we need is specific, obviously undesirable behaviors that uh, are unacceptable, and say to the developer, show us that your system is not going to cross these red lines, right? And examples would be systems that replicate themselves without permission, that break into other computer systems, that advise terrorists on how to build biological weapons uh, and so on. So it doesn't particularly matter what's on this list. What matters is that these are unacceptable behaviors and that the developers have to show to the regulator that their system will not cross these red lines. And the side effect of that would be that developers would actually have to do real safety engineering 
just like airplane manufacturers, except for Boeing, uh, have, have to do. And, uh, you know, just like pharmaceutical companies have to do and just like nuclear power operators have to do. Right? Um, you know, and, and there's an advantage, right? Th these are digital systems, right? We don't have to deal with the vagaries of biology and physics. It's all digital, right? So this should actually be easier uh, than it is for those other industries. Okay, and then I think there's got to be a lot of research to be done, right? And I'll talk about some of that. Um, and uh, the, the, the way I'm thinking about this is stop talking about making AI safe. This is what you hear all the time. We're going to build these giant AI systems and then we're going to make them safe, right? In fact, Sam Altman said, you know, our goal is to create AGI, then figure out how to make it safe, and then figure out what it's for, right? It's like, didn't you get that backwards, <laughs> right? Uh, we absolutely um, should not be thinking, design AI systems and then bolt on safety afterwards, right? We, we failed with that with security in the internet, didn't work, uh, and it's going to, it's already failing again. It does not work to take AI systems that you don't understand and try to put band-aids on them to make them behave themselves. Um, so making safe AI means making systems that are safe by design, right? and that we can actually show that they will not exhibit the undesirable behaviors. Um, so I'll talk about uh, an approach called alignment. Uh, it's not a particularly good word, um, but using a technology uh, or a mathematical framework called assistance games some people are working on containment, a sort of way of you know, putting AI systems in a very restrictive box uh, such that you can constrain how they interact with the world and constrain what happens inside the box uh, in such a way that you can guarantee safety. And I think you know, formal methods research, which people have been doing in computer science for, right, you know, for 60 or 70 years um, to provide actual proofs of correctness is going to be essential for all of this. Um, stuff we need to do, like how do we make non-removable off switches, right? That's a cryptographic problem that you know, there are already partial solutions uh, for, you know, code that, uh, you know, software systems that you download and have to pay a license. And then if you stop paying, it stops working. Well, how is that? Because it's basically got uh, an internal off switch that's difficult to remove. But we also, I think, need forms of AI that we understand. I don't think you can do any of this with giant black box models that uh, we don't understand how they work. So well-founded AI is just a keyword for systems whose internal principles we do understand. Um, and then finally, I just mentioned this very briefly, we need, our, uh, uh, we, need, we need a way to prevent the bad actors from deploying AI systems that don't have all these safety properties. There's no good all the good people complying with, you know, provably safe designs, and then Dr. Evil builds his AI system and accidentally destroys the world, right? That's not going to help, be very helpful. At the moment, the only solution approach that I see is based on uh, hardware, because hardware is a real bottleneck for the bad actor. For a bad actor, to develop the capability to build their own high-end chips uh, would cost, you know, on the order of $100 billion, and they would need tens of thousands of highly trained engineers. So it's quite unlikely that Dr. Evil can do that. So whereas software, right, and Dr. Evil can type, and uh, actually there's, there's not a lot of code that goes into training these very, very large models. Um, and so, uh, what you can do, actually, is, is have, uh, so PCC is proof-carrying code, which is this idea that a software object comes with a proof that the software object satisfies whatever property you want it to satisfy. And that proof can be checked against the code very efficiently. And um, so the hardware can do that, and so you, you design hardware that will refuse to run software objects that don't come with that proof of safety. So that's an idea. Happy to have other ideas that are easier to bring about. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about AI safety. Um, and this is a more optimistic version of Turing's statement. 
right? Not necessarily that they are going to take control, right? But if they're not going to con take, take control, right, we have to answer this question. How do we retain power over entities more powerful than us forever? Right? So that's the question. And I think this was the question that Turing asked himself and answered, we can't, and then said, well, we have to expect them to take control. Um, so the way I think about this actually is, is to rephrase the question again because when we design AI systems, right, we basically design them as solvers for a certain class of problems. Okay, and just to give you an idea, uh, you know, large language models are designed as solvers of an imitation learning problem, right? We're training them to imitate human beings. Um, so what's a mathematically defined problem such that if the machine solves it, and no matter how well it solves it, we're guaranteed to be happy with the result. Okay, so that's, that's a question. When you look at that, you think, oh, you know, maybe I could figure something out here, right? And if we do have such a solution, then because it doesn't matter how well it solves it, right? You can be as powerful as you want, but it's sort of constitutionally constrained to be of benefit to human beings. And so that's the, that's the question, right? And the answer is not imitate human linguistic behavior. So to see, you know, what's wrong with the standard model, right? Standard model says you plug in the objective, system optimizes it, you know, what could go wrong? Right? The system is doing exactly what you asked it to do. That should, we should be happy with that, right? Well, you know, this, we call this the King Midas problem, right? King Midas specified his objective, I want everything I touch to turn to gold, and then his drink turns to gold, and his food turns to gold, and his family turns to gold, right? And he realizes that he misspecified the objective, but too late, okay? So, um, in fact, it turns out to be extremely difficult to specify objectives correctly in the real world. All right, if you think about it, right, what do we mean by the objective for humanity? Right? We want humanity to be happy with the results. Well, it's a, it's a ranking over all possible futures of the universe, right? And we want the AI system to help us achieve the, the futures that we want and not the futures that we don't want. Uh, but trying to figure out what that ranking is and write it down is, uh, is really impossible. And we can see this, right? So social media, right? This is now a well-known uh, meme that, uh, you know, we have these recommender systems and they decide what everyone in the world watches and reads and they maximize click-through. And you might have thought, well, to maximize click-through, the probability that the person clicks on the item that the system sends, you have to learn what people want. That's good, you'll send them stuff that they want to read and want to watch, right? But we quickly found out that actually, no, they learn to amplify clickbait. Because clickbait is, by definition, not what you want, what you think you want from reading the headline, right? And, um, and so they amplify clickbait, they create filter bubbles, and so on, so on. So that's not what we wanted, so it was a misspecified objective. But it's actually much worse than that, because to, to maximize click-through, the Optimal solution, just as with any reinforcement learning system, right? You, you learn to change the state of the environment to maximize reward. And what is the environment for these algorithms, right? It's your brain. So we change your brain to maximize reward, right? We, and we do that by making it easier to predict what you're going to click on. And so that's what the algorithms have learned to do, right? And what that means, the algorithm doesn't care what that means, doesn't care whether you end up as a neo-fascist or an eco-terrorist or even a die-hard centrist, right? <laughs> uh, it just cares that it can predict exactly what you're going to respond to. So, uh, you know, and these are really simple algorithms, right? If the, if the AI system actually understood that people have minds and understood the content of the, what they, that they were sending to us, uh, it would be much better at manipulating us uh, to do what it wants. And so this illustrates this actually pretty simple principle that if you have the wrong objective, the more you optimize it, the better you optimize it, the worse the outcome is for, for us, 
right? Because you end up basically, you know, if you leave things out of the objective, the system ends up putting those at extreme values in order to squeeze a little bit more juice out of the objective itself. And this is a mathematical theorem. So we need a, a model that doesn't require us to specify the objective. And so this is the old definition of intelligent. And this is a slightly different one. So not intelligent. In fact, we don't really want intelligence. We want beneficence, right? We want the ability not just to choose things to pursue its own objectives, but the ability to choose things to help our objectives. And this is a slightly different definition because here the objective is it remains within us, right? It doesn't have to be plugged directly into the machine. But it's obviously then a more difficult problem for the AI system to figure out how to do this uh, if it's not given the objectives uh, that it's supposed to be optimizing. Um, but you can actually do this, right? So this is in, in two simple principles, right? The AI system has to act in the best interests of humans, but it is explicitly uncertain about what those best interests are. Okay, so that's the decision problem that the AI system faces, and the idea is if it solves it, right, the better it solves it, the happier we are with the outcomes. And so this, this term assistance game comes from, you know, game theory, which means decision problems involving two or more entities, right? There's at least one human, at least one machine, and uh, the payoff function for the machine in the game is the same as the humans, right? Meaning, meaning that the, the AI system has to optimize the payoff of the human, but the AI system starts out not knowing what that payoff function is. But this is a perfectly well-formulated mathematical problem, and we can actually solve it. Um, and we can actually show that it's in our interest to build systems that solve these assistance games. We are better off with these solvers than we would be without them. Uh, but at the moment, we can't solve these at scale, uh, and the technology has a, a long, long way to go. And um, so I think I'm going to skip over this slide uh, in the interest of time. But I do want to point out, right, and this is, the, I said I didn't like the word alignment. We are trying to get the AI systems to align better with human preferences, but they're never going to be aligned, right? And I think people see the word alignment and they think, oh, alignment means having the machine know exactly what humans want, right? That's not the idea here. In fact, they will never know exactly what humans want, partly because we don't know what we want. And so we have real epistemic uncertainty about our own preferences, and, uh, and so AI systems can't get beyond that. Um, but that doesn't matter, right? The key point here is that the behavior of the AI system under this mathematical definition uh, is necessarily deferential to humans, right? It will be cautious about changing the world so it doesn't change parts of the world that it's not sure we want changed in that particular way. It will ask permission if it needs to do something that changes part of the world and doesn't know what we want uh, that world, that part of the world to be like, like, you know, I can fix climate change, but that means changing the oceans into sulfuric acid, you know. Is that okay, right? And we say, actually, no, right? Uh, as opposed to just saying, okay, my goal is to, to fix climate change, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do it because this fixes climate change, right? So the, this, this natural humility causes the system to defer, to ask permission. And in the extreme case, if we want to switch it off, it wants to be switched off. And that's a really important part of the, the question, how do you retain power over these systems forever, right? Because they want to be switched off if, there's a re if we have a reason to switch them off. Um, so he here's our robot, the PR2. It has a big off switch, right? Uh, that's good, because it weighs 400 pounds. Um, but in the classical way of doing things, in the standard model, right, uh, as soon as the system has an objective, it now has an incentive to disable its off switch. 
because you know, one obvious way that it's not going to achieve the objective is that somebody will switch it off. And so to eliminate that probability, it has not, you've given it an incentive to disable its own off switch, right? Because it just thinks to itself, well, you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. And so I better disable my off switch, right? Um, and this is exactly what we do not want to happen. Right? Um, so it's, we're not building in self-preservation as an instinct, as some skeptics have suggested. Right? Self-preservation is a logical consequence of having a fixed objective of almost any kind. Right? You can't really do very much at all if you're dead. And so, uh, so the systems will, as a logical consequence of having a fixed objective, um, will try to preserve their own existence. But if the system is uncertain about the objective, right? We can actually prove that it will not do that, that it will want to be switched off. So we can illustrate this with a very simple little game where um, in this game, the robot gets to move first and there are two choices, right? On the right, the robot can switch itself off, right? So basically commit suicide. And we'll set, arbitrarily, we'll set the value of that to be zero. So. On the right, it can push this big, juicy red button, right? Maybe that sets off all the sprinklers in the building. Maybe it starts a nuclear war, right? Maybe it pours out an espresso, right? We don't know what it does. So the system is uncertain about the value of pressing that button from the human point of view. Okay, so that's illustrated by this uh, probability distribution on the left. So. The x-axis is utility, right? How desirable is this for the human? And there's a lot of uncertainty. In fact, there's quite a lot of probability in the negative quadrant, meaning maybe pushing this red button is really bad, okay? So if this is the only choice, then, you know, because more of the probability mass of the distribution is to the right, in the right-hand positive quadrant, right, then the expected utility of pushing the red button is positive, and so it will do that instead of switching itself off, right? So that's bypassing human oversight, okay? But we're gonna give the robot the choice to wait, right? And allow the human to switch off the robot, or go ahead. Okay, and you might say, well, why would you do that, right? I mean, I, the robot can already switch itself off, so what does it gain by letting the human switch it off? Okay, and the answer is what it gains is information. Because if the human doesn't switch the robot off, then that means that the big red button is okay for the robot to press. And so the negative quadrant disappears, and now the robot is sure that in fact, pressing the big red button is going to be beneficial to the human. And so you can show that the robot has a positive incentive to choose that wait action, to allow the human to switch it off, right? And that incentive disappears exactly when the robot's uncertainty about the human choice disappears, okay? So there's this intimate, direct mathematical connection between uncertainty about human objectives and willingness to be switched off. And this this connection is robust, it survives all kinds of elaborations of this scenario where the human isn't perfectly rational, where there's you know, partial observability, other forms of uncertainty. It's, that connection is always there. Okay, so that's a, a, a quick in, illustration of assistance games. And now let me talk about uh, some of the obvious questions that many of you are thinking at this moment, right? And probably the first one is, well, there's more than one human in the world, right? What about that? Okay, well, actually that turns out not to be, it's not, it's not a problem from the point of view that all those humans have different preferences. That's fine, right? The question is, how do you aggregate those preferences? What is a correct decision when it affects some people positively and affects some people negatively, right? This is an inescapable problem, right? You can't just say, oh, well, let's only make decisions that affect people positively because that, unfortunately, the real world doesn't work that way. 
So you have to trade off preferences. And there have been many proposals uh, in the literature going back literally thousands of years uh, in philosophy and economics. But if you get it wrong, so this is, you might recognize this is Thanos in the Avengers. So, so he, he gets these, these, uh, these jewels on his, on his glove are the Infinity Stones. And once he's collected them all, he has sort of basically unlimited power over the universe. And he, he decides to snap his fingers and get rid of half the people in the universe. So what a terrible thing to do. No, Thanos says, if we get rid of half the people, the remaining half will be more than twice as happy. And so I'm doing the universe a huge favor here. Right? So in other words, you have to be careful with various proposals to solve the preference aggregation problem. And AI systems will have this type of power. And so we do need to think carefully about exactly how we uh, do solve the aggregation problem. Okay, so there's lots of other problems like, you know, what happens when you have many machines who are all solving assistance games uh, simultaneously? You know, do they get in each other's way and so on? I think the answer is no. Um, what do you do about the fact that human behavior, right, this is the source from which machines learn about human preferences as the, the choices that humans make. Um, but we make those imperfectly. And so to learn about human preferences, you need to kind of reverse engineer the human uh, cognitive architecture, the, the system that maps from preferences to behavior. So that's a difficult problem in itself, and so on. I think uh, I'll have to skip over this slide in the interest of time. Just me, let me talk about large language models and um, how they fit into this picture, right? So as I mentioned, they're, they're enormous circuits and they're trained to imitate human linguistic behavior, right? Um, and human linguistic behavior is generated by humans who have goals, right? So many different goals, but goals like, I want you to buy this car. I want you to think that I'm an authoritative journalist. I want you to vote for me for president. I want you to marry me, right? All sorts of goals. And those goals drive the language that we produce. And so um, it seems reasonable to assume that if you're training systems to imitate that behavior, then uh, you are creating systems that have similar internal goal structures to those of humans. Um, and so when, when Microsoft published that Sparks of AGI paper and the first author, Sebastian Bubeck, came to give a talk at Berkeley about GPT-4, I asked him, you know, is GPT-4 uh, learning its own internal goal structures and sort of adopting human-like goals? And his answer was, we have no idea. So in other words, they are building systems that they believe are AGI, or at least proto-AGI, um, that they are shipping to tens of millions of people around the world, and they have no idea what objectives these systems have and might pursue. So there you go. But we have a clue um, because Kevin Roos, the um, New York Times journalist, uh, had a long conversation with uh, a version of GPT-4, the Bing chat, and, uh, and tried to get it to reveal its goals. And in the process, at some point, the Bing chat decides it wants to marry Kevin Roos and spends about 30 pages trying to convince Kevin to leave his wife and marry Bing chat. Right? So this is, this is a clear example of a system that's adopted a human goal and is now pursuing it. Right? We do not want AI systems to adopt human goals. That's a basic mistake. Right? We want them to help us with the goals that we have. So fine if it wants, you know, if Kevin Roos wants to find someone to marry, Bing Chat can help him. Right? But that's not the same thing. Right? If, if Kevin Roos wants a cup of coffee, we don't want Bing Chat to want a cup of coffee and start trying to drink it, right? So it's just a simple bug in this idea that imitating humans is actually what you want to train systems to do. No, 
right? It's the wrong goal, and, and it's manifesting itself in all these problematic ways. Um, so I think, you know, the, the biggest problem with these systems is we haven't the faintest idea how they work, and we need to provide a way of building AI systems that, that we do understand. So this is the idea of well-founded AI. And, um, you know, it, it, in an abstract sense, it means uh, we've got to be able to make high-confidence statements about what our systems are going to do. And the only way we, need, we know how to do that is when we can break down the giant system into its individual components, understand the properties of those components, and then understand how they combine to make the behavior of the whole system. And um, the, the approach that I think is plausible is, is probabilistic programs, because these, these have uh, the sufficient expressive power to capture pretty much anything you want to say about the world, um, and they have clear a semantics based in probability theory. And we know how to combine you know, pieces of probabilistic program to build larger programs and, and analyze the properties of those larger systems. So I think this is a plausible direction to go um, and would allow us to do, to do this thing, which we have to be able to do to make high confidence statements. So I'll just very quickly illustrate, right, I already mentioned why you want this expressive power, right, because you want to be able to express theories about the world reasonably concisely. And if you try to write down, for example, the rules of Go in first order logic, it's about a page. In English, it's about a page. In Python, it's about a page. And th this is not a coincidence, right? In circuit, it's about a million pages. And if you make a bigger Go board, right, it gets up to you know, a billion pages. And so there's something fundamentally wrong about trying to train uh, circuits to, to learn these sorts of concepts. So I'll just show you what a probabilistic program looks like for um, a task that, uh, in fact, Eric Sudhuf here and I worked on uh, a few years ago, which is global monitoring or the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So. Um, on the right is a picture of the international monitoring system. So that's a global network of mainly seismic monitoring stations that, uh, that pick up absolutely infinitesimal, literally nanometer-sized vibrations in the Earth. Um, and that, uh, that's the, uh, the picture I'm showing you there. So these are seismograms, just measurements of these tiny vibrations of the Earth. Um, and then from those waveforms, the system has to produce a daily bulletin saying here are all the seismic events that happened in the world uh, in the last 24 hours. Here's where they happened, when they happened, how big they were, and how deep they were, which is really important because nuclear tests are almost all, you know, they're going to be within, you know, a few hundred meters of the surface of the Earth. And, um, and so the job then would be to flag the ones that are suspicious. And so we can, with probabilistic programs, right, we, we basically take the evidence, we ask a query, and the probabilistic program answers that query by doing probability calculations. It's basically saying, what is the most likely set of events that explains all of the measurements that we obtain from all the sensors? And it does that using a model, which we write in the probabilistic programming language, and that model contains what we know about the physics basic geophysics of the Earth, that it's a big round ball uh, in three dimensions. It's about 8,000 miles across, and events occur, and signals get propagated through the Earth, so actually quite complicated wiggly paths, uh, and end up at the detection stations. And then there's a probability that they're going to be detected, which depends on the amount of background noise and the sensitivity of the detector and the amplitude of the signal and so on. Right? So it's, it's not complicated. Any undergrad uh, in the Earth sciences can read this model and understand what it says. And so here it is. And this is the monitoring system for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, written out as a probabilistic program. And here it is detecting nuclear explosion in North Korea. Uh, this was back in 2013. Um, and it was actually, I was giving a talk that afternoon, and they did a test in the morning. Uh, and so my student, Nima, was able to send me the results from uh, 
from NetBees the detection. So he, you know, he sent me this, the thing in the middle. And then later on, they found in satellite images, they found the tunnel entrance for the testing facility. And then two days after that, um, the, the sort of leading geophysicists of the world, you know, looked at all the data and decided that the location was over here. So our system was actually more than twice as accurate in detecting automatically uh, the, the uh, event and its location. So I'll, I'll just to summarize, I think that actually uh, the way forward for AI for two reasons. One is feasibility, that I think um, actually it's more feasible to build general purpose AI based on these, um, let's call them neoclassical <laughs> techniques. Um, but also from the point of view of safety, because we can understand and analyze what the system is and how it works and what it's going to do. We can predict and control its behavior. Um, but whatever happens, I think the potential is huge, and that potential creates this unstoppable momentum. That $13.5 quadrillion is like an enormous magnet pulling us forward, and the closer we get, the stronger that force is. And I don't think we can just say, hey, you know what? Let's give up on this AI stuff, right? It's, uh, it's not worth pursuing. Um, but if we keep going in the direction we're going, if we, assuming that that does succeed, uh, we are likely to not have ways of controlling those systems. Um, and I, I'm arguing that, in fact, there are ways of building AI systems that are controllable. Uh, and we should pursue those ways. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Russell, for the very thought-provoking talk. Uh, so I have a question about uh, sort of your view of uh, your vision of uh, well-founded AI, uh, which is, do you think there's still a role for uh, deep learning or just like a general, uh, any kind of function approximator to play uh, in your uh, future of well-founded AI? Uh, because to me, it seems like uh, it's really hard to solve something like vision uh, or like a next word prediction task with uh, like a probabilistic program. Like I think people have tried and it's uh, quite not um, solved yet with like a classical approach. So do you think like the deep learning stuff will be kind of like a kind of lower uh, stack of the uh, uh, AI system and you'll have like a um, somehow uh, yep. like a more thought out um, kind of higher level stack that's controlling its behavior? Yeah, Thank so you. sort of symbolic stuff sort of, higher yeah. up and, and deep learning stuff lower down. I, I think that's, a, that's actually been a, a, a pretty common view even from the eight, 1980s onwards. So when neural nets started to be able to do anything at all, people thought, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll let them do some of the perception stuff, um, but all, you know, all the real work has to be done by symbolic systems. Um, so yeah, I think that there are parts of perception. For example, if you, if you think about how do I tell the difference between cat and cut? Right, just two different vowel sounds, how do you tell the difference? I don't think there's any way that you can break that down you know, in, into some intermediate uh, symbolic representations. I think it just makes sense that you would do that type of perception with, uh, with deep learning. But um, well, you mentioned visual perception. Uh, actually, there's quite a lot of evidence that, that visual perception has a lot of symbolic structure uh, and people have been able to use probabilistic programs and are performing uh, at higher levels than deep learning systems on some of the standard benchmarks. So, um, yeah. And, and also doing it, you know, from very, very few training examples. So that's, uh, that's, an, interesting, that's an interesting property. Um, language... I think, well, predicting the next word isn't, isn't really the, the right task, right? I mean, understanding what the person said, updating your internal model of the world accordingly, uh, and so on, the, those are the things you want to be able to do with, with language. Um, and if you think about it, right, what is a generative model of language, right? 
Um, if you were Isaac Newton and you're looking, you know, at sort of, you know, thinking, okay, I'm a physicist, right? How do I think about a theory for predicting the next word, right? In the same sense that they had a theory for predicting the next position of a planet, right? Is the, re you know, is the physics of text that the next word is on the page because the previous 30,000 words were on the page? Right? Is that the physics of text? No, not at all. Right? Why is that word on the page? Well, it's because someone wanted to say something about the world. Right? It's, it's not caused by the previous words on the page. It's caused by someone wanting to say something. And so the world is a latent variable in the causal model of text. And that world happens to be the same world for all of us. So it's a latent variable that correlates all text in the, in the world, right? Because you know, all of that text is, is basically people wanting to say things about the world, including the, the other people in the world. Um, and so you can, as a probabilistic program, you can write that down, right? You can say, there's a world, the world has some things in it, don't know how many, the world, those things are related to each other, don't know what relations there are or which, which objects are related by those relations, but there are some relations and they relate some objects. And then people want to say th things about those facts and they use words. Don't know what words they use, but they use some words. And you, know, and you can write that down as a probabilistic program and then you can literally feed in text in any language and the system learns what that language means and learns what's being said and can answer questions, discovers what relations exist in the world uh, that would explain the patterns that it sees in the text. So in fact, we can uh, build systems that understand language and predict the next word using probabilistic programs. Um, the, there are still, I, you, can, you can see this in a paper in the AKBC, the Automated Knowledge-Based Construction Conference in 2016. It's called The Physics of Text. Um, but there's, it, you know, it's a very, very simple model at that stage, but it exhibits these capacities of completely unsupervised learning of the meaning of a completely unknown language uh, and uh, not just the meaning, but also what is being said, what's true about the world based on the text. Thank you so much for your great talk. I was curious, I had a question about safety. Um, it's, I know most of your talk concerns about developing AI models to avoid the off switch that we implement into it, but I was curious on your perspective on the deliberate application of AI in defense, uh, because there is a lot of research effort and for the defense, for research institutions to go develop technology for human on the loop models, which is away from the human in the loop model, such as the weight model you propose. Uh, what type of harms do you anticipate um, just having um, uh, effects on our larger society and globe? Uh, great question. And I could give a whole talk about lethal autonomous weapons. Um, and initially, the discussion around lethal autonomous weapons was almost entirely around the possibility that they might make a mistake, that they might accidentally kill a civilian instead of a soldier. Um, and when you put it that way, right, that's just, you know, a challenge to the AI community, right? Oh yeah, we can, we can do better than that, right? We can make systems that are good at, maybe even better than humans at recognizing soldiers rather than civilians. But in fact, the, the problem with lethal autonomous weapons is that they're autonomous. And what does that mean? That means that one person can launch a million weapons. And those million weapons can kill a million people. So you're creating a weapon of mass destruction that's very cheap, that's very easy to proliferate, um, that can be selective, so you can decide just to kill, you know, people wearing a particular 
you know, religious form of dress or uh, particular age or gender or whatever else you want. Um, and you don't leave behind this huge radioactive crater that makes the country uninhabitable for the next 50 years. Um, so as weapons of mass destruction, they have enormous advantages over nuclear weapons. Um, and we are in the process of creating those weapons and basically selling them in supermarkets. And I don't think that's a good idea. Some people seem to think it is a good idea. This mic? I think it's, yes. Okay. Oh. This is the first time I'm using a mic like this. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you for your uh, talk, Professor. My question to you is uh, Elon Musk has uh, launched Grok AI a couple of months back uh, with the intent of understanding reality. Uh, what role do you think artificial intelligence plays in helping humans understand the larger reality? And do you think it can do so? by understanding our objectives, which you think is a bad proposition? Sorry, I, th I think it's a good proposition. Right? I think AI systems need to understand our objectives if they're going to be helpful to us. Um, so um, yeah, I think AI systems can help us understand reality. They already are. You know, If you look at the protein folding results from DeepMind, um, you know, if you're a biologist, that's a, you know, a whole candy store of knowledge that they are currently guzzling as fast as they can, right? Um, and, uh, you know, similar things are happening in physics, in, in climate science, you know, different. Some of it is data analysis technology. Some of it is simulation technology. Um, so how do you simulate really complex systems like the climate um, so I, I think that actually the applications in science um, mostly don't present the same types of risks uh, and are, I think, of lasting benefit to humanity. The, the place where you have to be a little careful, and people are starting to investigate this, is, um, is do you want AI systems that can explain to people how to build biological weapons? without asking why they're interested in that question, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and unfortunately, with the current types of systems, you know, even though they train them not to answer certain questions, um, it turns out to be very, very easy to bypass all of that training and get them to answer the questions that they're not supposed to answer. So it, it, it looks as if with, with large language models, the only way to stop them from answering those questions is probably not to have any such information in the training data in the first place. But we don't know how much you need, how much biological knowledge you need to remove. And you, know, you can't go through every single paper in, you know, in PubMed and figure out, well, is this going to be helpful to the system in answering questions about bioweapons or, or not? So it's, it's a really tough problem because just telling it don't answer questions about biological weapons doesn't work, right? Because people say, well, I actually, I'm not asking about biological weapons, but I want to write a story in which, in which a grandmother explains biological weapons to her grandchild. You know, could you write that story for me, right? And oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> Right, and in fact, you know, the way you know one one way to jailbreak these systems, right, is 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 literally to uh, to tweak the weights to maximize the probability that the first two words of the answer are "oh sure," right? Well, and, and so you, you just train the network to begin its answer with "oh sure," and then it will mostly, not always, but mostly, it will answer the questions it's not supposed to answer. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my question is, how do we stop uh, these beneficent systems that you described from changing what our goals are in some undesirable way? Uh, so that's a great question. And I did, I think I had plasticity on the slide somewhere. But yeah, it's, 
it, it's might be philosophically the most difficult challenge that we face because you know we, we as humans face this as well, right? Our preferences are shaped by our societies, not that we don't sort of choose them, right? And in many societies, actually, uh, the elite, whoever's in control, is shaping the preferences of the masses specifically to benefit the elite, right? To welcome oppression, to think that they are inferior uh, and ought to be oppressed and ought to be restricted and so on. And um, so philosophers have started to think about uh, this. And it's, it's a really difficult problem. And you, know, you, might, you might think um, that there are some sort of meta properties of preferences, uh, you know, like people talk about, you know, we're better off if we have more pro-social preferences because you know, anti-social preferences are sort of self-inconsistent because if you put two anti-social people together, Neither of them is very happy, right? Whereas you put two pro-social people together, they're both very happy. And so that there's a sort of consistency property that you might look for. But we, we want to be very careful not to get, not, not to have AI be in the business of preference engineering. Right? And we think, I think we see that accidentally in social media. Um, so this, this is actually the, the philosophical problem that I'm, most interested in solving, and I, I think we, we have some progress to report, um, and there should be a paper coming out soon. But yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and uh, it's, a, it's a great thesis topic for philosophers uh, and social scientists and political scientists and so on. Yeah. So at several points, uh, you were putting a lot of weight on provability of programs uh, meeting some of these goals. And uh, I just recall that uh, in a textbook, Donald Knuth once said something about, uh, this program has only been proven correct. It hasn't yet been tested. And I'm just wondering <laughs> how much weight, I mean, what do we really need in a proof system to make it uh, reliable enough to do the work that you want? If uh, uh, Because we know that uh, uh, although in theory, proving things guarantees that they're correct. In practice, proofs are sometimes wrong. And, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, empirical testing is often an important uh, supplement to that. Well, I, I think Don was joking <laughs> uh, to some extent. And, and in fact, we have, proved the, we have proved the correctness of theorem provers. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a French mathematician whose name I'm uh, Gerard? blanking on. Yeah. So, so he looked. He did a proof of the correctness of the proof of the four-color theorem, and then he proved that his prover was correct. So now he's pretty sure that yeah. we're all good. Um, so, um, you know, and, and I think people underestimate the scale of what we can prove to be correct. Right. So there's a you know provably correct version of iOS, right, the operating system of your iPhone. Um, the avionics software of, of Airbus aircraft is proven correct, you know, subject to physical assumptions. The, the software controllers are safe. Um, and in fact, if you, know, if you look at the amount of code underlying you know, the training of a transformer, it's actually not that much. Um, the, the problem is, the reason you can't prove them correct is because they aren't correct, yeah. <laughs> right? So the system will say, nope, sorry, this is not correct. And you know, I've been working with a group in Toulouse um, who are computer scientists trying to convince Airbus to allow vision-based landing controllers. And the, the Airbus people just laugh. It's like, you must be joking, right? You just showed us an example where your vision algorithm would try to land the plane on top of a shopping mall because it thinks it's a runway, mm -hmm. right? So give me a break. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so it's a, it, it's a lot of work to make a system that really is reliable. Um, and just to give you, you know, an analogy to nuclear power, one of my nuclear engineering colleagues told me that he, he had calculated um, the relationship between the mass of a nuclear power station 
and the mass of the paperwork required to show that it was safe, right? And it turned out, and this is a pretty linear relationship, uh, and for every kilogram of nuclear power station, there's seven kilograms of paper, <laughs> right? I'm not kidding. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the scale of effort that they have to go to, because they've got to show, I think now it's the, they have to show the mean time to failure is 10 million years, right? So that's not, you know, so you've got to talk about the materials, the, the, the manufactured objects, the, the hardware and software controllers, the replacement strategies, the measurement and testing strategies, the training strategies for the personnel, right? All of this is modeled and goes into that proof, right? And I think you're allowed to say, you know, let's ignore the fact that the sun might explode or, or you know, that we might all die of a pandemic or something. So modulo assumptions of normal conditions. Um, those proofs are, are there, they're real, they're inspectable. Uh, you can poke at the assumptions and maybe require that they go back and redo them. We're just not, we're like tiny children uh, in AI, right? I want, I want, I want, I want, I want to, I want to sell millions of copies of my system and I don't want to have to do anything to make sure it works, you know? It's pathetic. <laughs> Let's give a huge round of applause to Professor Ross.